thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. So yes, um, as was mentioned, I'm going to be talking about targeting of conservation practices. And so the title of this is, is One Size Does Not Fit All. And this is where we're looking at regional conservation practice guidance. So really this strategizing of targeting BMPs based on the landscape that you're in. And we're using the Lake Erie watershed as an example. So this is really something that we're using, as I said, the Lake Erie watershed as an example, but this approach is definitely transferable to a lot of other watersheds and, and should be transferred to those. So just a, a quick primer on, on Lake Erie. So we know that Lake Erie has a long history of water quality impairment. We know that there was improvements in the 80s and the 90s that were really driven by wastewater treatment cleanups and a lot of point source cleanups. And today it's really dominated by non-point source pollution. And Lake Erie has really undergone a re-eutrophication and we're experiencing um, significant harmful and nuisance algal blooms. So we know that we've been applying BMPs throughout the watershed, but things aren't necessarily getting better. Some of this might be climate intensification. Some might be legacy phosphorus, which you're going to hear about a little bit later today. Some might be that we're not doing enough BMPs or conservation practices, but it may also be that we might not be using the right conservation practices in the right places. So this is a summary diagram that the CSA News did to, to summarize the findings from a, paper, a recent paper that we wrote look at, that explores this topic directly. And many of the things that you're gonna see today are from this paper. Um, but like I said, uh, we're trying to set up a, a framework for targeted conservation practice guidance. And like I said, we've used the Lake Erie watershed as a case study, and we're really halfway to step one in our framework work, which is really just the point of, ref of de defining to start phosphorus management regions. And so I'm gonna walk you through how we arrived at this today. And, and then we can come back to some of these next steps later on. So let's start with really the analysis of the Lake Erie watershed. So when we think about climatic variability across regions, we might think about how things differ, say between uh, the Great Lakes region and say the Northern Great Plains or other regions, but we don't maybe think about subtle things, subtle differences that might exist within our own region that might be really important to water quality or the efficacy of conservation practices. So when we think about precipitation, this is a graphic that's showing you precipitation. You're seeing annual precipitation, you're seeing mean annual temperatures, growing degree days, and then the duration of snow cover. And so for a precipitation standpoint, Although there's some wetter and drier areas in the Lake Erie watershed, from a grand, in, in the grand scheme of things, it's a pretty humid area. But we do find that as you go towards the northeast, we get more of this precipitation occurs as snowfall and also more, it stays on the ground for longer. So we have a more, uh, a stronger winter season. And then of course, this is going to translate into snow melt at the end of that season. And we also can see as you head towards the south at, southwestern end, we don't see as much in terms of, uh, sorry, we have uh, lower snow, snow cover duration and longer growing degree days. I just want to make sure I'm seeing things in the chat and I don't know if somebody's trying to reach me or uh, if everything's okay. Um, okay, so uh, with regards to landscape differences, you can see that we have um, differences both in terms of the, the slope throughout the watershed. As you go around the lake, you can see that it's very, very flat and low, low elevation around the lake. But as you move to the periphery, we start to see higher sloping ground areas, uh, more elevation. And we see around the lake itself, we can see a lot of these fine grained lacustrine clays. And then as you move out to the periphery, we start to see more um, in terms of um, coarser textured soils. Um, that are more have well drained. 
When we think about management throughout the watershed, certainly the yellow is showing you corn soy rotation. And so you can see that absolutely dominates through the watershed. But once you start to get towards the northeastern side, we do start to see um, more in terms of getting winter wheat into the rotation. Uh, tile drainage is something that's rather important. If we look towards the southwestern end of the Lake Erie watershed, there's a considerable amount of tile drained land and we don't have quite as much as you move towards the northeast. So when we start to put together things like land use, but climate, landscape attributes, whether it's soil texture, slope, you name it, we, we put these together and we use the K-means test and we defined phosphorus potential definite or look for endpoints in terms of these regions that might demonstrate to us where the characteristics of that region might differ based on the things that I've talked about to date. And what we found is that we really had these two endpoints. So we had the Northeast and we had the Southwest. So the Northeast of course is what you can see in the blue and the Southwest is what we see in the red. And then we have these more transitional areas in between and we call those transition north and transition south. But ultimately, these differ in terms of their climate, in terms of their landscape attributes. And we know that this is going to have a lot of implications for phosphorus transfer. So when we start to think about how phosphorus is leaving fields, we know and we've known for a long time that phosphorus leaves fields in overland flow. We're concerned about dissolved phosphorus, but also the erosion of surface soils and the particulate phosphorus that's going to leave those fields. Tile drains, on the other hand, are something that we didn't really focus on for, uh, we really used to think that if you got water underground, that things would be, uh, let the soil, the soil, the water would be buffered and that anything coming out of the ground, we weren't really concerned about. But we now know that tile drains can actually become a substantial phosphorus pathway. And of course, that has caught a lot of attention, both in terms of farmers and decision makers and scientists. So there's a lot of discussion about tiles. So where do these different regions come into play? Well, we find that throughout the Lake Erie watershed, based on our edge of field studies, that probably 80% of the water leaves below ground in tile drainage at the edge of the field, and maybe 20% is above ground in surface runoff. But when we think about phosphorus, the story changes. When we start to get to that northeastern end, we find that perhaps 50-50 in terms of the phosphorus is leaving in surface runoff and less and 50% or even less is leaving in tile drainage. So that 20% of the flow accounts for disproportionately more phosphorus. Whereas when we start to think about the southwestern end of the watershed, we find that tile drainage is probably about 80% of the phosphorus at the edge of the field that's being lost. And we also know that there's more, uh, particulate phosphorus dominates throughout the watershed, but dissolved phosphorus becomes more important in those, in that southwestern end that's dominated by those lacustrine clays. So we do see differences in terms of where and in what form most of that phosphorus is leaving the fields. But the fact is that we do have to manage in both the surface and the subsurface. And so when we start to think about beneficial management practices or conservation practices and water quality, it becomes a little bit tricky. Well, what do we want to do? And is the same, in light of the fact that the way that phosphorus is moving and the form that it's in and maybe the timing of that, because in the Northeast, I think the non-growing season is important throughout the entire watershed, but it becomes so much more important. That snowmelt period becomes so much more important as you move into those blue northeastern zones. So when we start to think about things that we can do, we have to take into account surface subsurface flow, but also that seasonality. And so a lot of what we know about conservation practices has really been developed during the non growing or during the growing season. And the winter period is something that's a little bit trickier, and that things that might work at one time of year may not work as well at other times of year. So we want to start to think about strategizing what we might do. And as we start to think about asking our farmers to make decisions, we can 
can't keep asking them to do more and more and more conservation practices because these all cost money and there's logistics associated with them that can be challenges. So if they're going to do a few things on their property, you want to make sure that they're doing the thing that's going to make the most sense for where they live. So we've all heard of the four R's. So let's think first about soil test phosphorus. So we know that the higher your soil test P, the greater your, your runoff concentrations may be or your runoff loads may be. And we've seen this across many, many regions. And certainly in these very highly elevated zones, getting that soil test P down is going to be a really important strategy. But we also have to remember that it's gonna take time. It doesn't happen overnight. Once you get down in the lower end, end, edge of things in terms of soil test P concentrations, where I think a lot more people might be in terms of their fields, you might find that there's not as much wiggle room. And so we can't rely on this and we have to think about other things. And so another fa factor has to do with where you might apply that phosphorus. And so we found in some, some of our edge of field studies that apply it and, and just some laboratory experiments that when you apply phosphorus in the subsurface in bands, rather than surface broadcasting, it actually disconnects that hot phosphorus source from the predominant pathways, which in the case of tile drainage, are preferential flow paths or macropores. So applying that phosphorus in the subsurface is something that can considerably reduce leaching losses in tile drainage. So when you think about landscapes that have a lot of nutrient losses in tile drainage, applying, thinking about where you apply those nutrients becomes really important. Um, timing, obviously we know never apply on frozen ground, but as you move towards the northeast, we really want to get it on as early in the season as we can. In the southwestern end, because they have a longer growing season and their falls are a little bit drier than ours, the, the fall is a little bit less tricky. But uh, certainly in that northeastern zone, get if you're putting fertilizer or manure on your fields quite late into the season, you really run the risk of those non-growing season losses. So some of our farmers have actually used incorporated wheat or winter wheat in the rotation, corn, soy, wheat, because it allows them to get that phosphorus on earlier in the season. But essentially for timing, applying, it's generally agreed across the regions that we're looking at, that if you can apply the subsurface at the time of seeding, it's optimal. Um, Tillage is another topic that's been really, really hot. There has been obviously some really wonderful work that's come out of Ohio that looked at uh, the effects of no-till and tile-drained landscapes and looked at the fact that we have some unintended consequences with regards to the fact that no-till can amplify uh, or increase phosphorus losses from tile drainage. But it looks like it isn't necessarily tillage that's doing it, it's more that the, the no-till is accompanied by the fact that you have it often surface broadcast that fertilizer. And so we did a study in Ontario and we found that with no-till and till among paired plots, that no-till didn't have any effect on tile drain nutrient and tile drain phosphorus losses. And it might be because we were in loam soils and it might be because we were in low soil test P fields and the fact that they applied their phosphorus in as subsurface placement. So we've been spending a lot of time trying to tease this out. But if we start to think about the tillage question, this is where the region that you live in becomes really important. So if we reflect on the Northeastern blue zone, most of our phosphorus is lost in surface runoff and particulate phosphorus. And we don't see a no-till till response in our tile drainage. So the fact is no-till is the best thing that they can do or one of the best things that we can do in the Northeastern end. Um, and the more farmers we can get on no-till, the better. Once you get to the southwestern end, the tillage question becomes a little bit more nuanced. And the fact is, is that we still think no-till no -till is good, but if you can accompany it with subsurface placement. And if you can't and you must surface broadcast, then a, sh a gentle tillage is probably not going to be detrimental and it's preferred to leaving it on the soil. Uh, cover crops are something that has a lot of promise. 
with regards to um, uh, weed control or reduction in particulate phosphorus losses at the surface, soil health and biodiversity. But there's a lot of evidence to suggest that phosphorus um, can be released following freeze thaw cycles um, in basically from frost kill of these plants. But a lot of the evidence for this comes from areas that have a lot more severe climates. So the Northern Great Plains, some wonderful works come out of there in the Nordic countries. So we did some work in Southern Ontario where we have a lot more snow cover. And we found that because of that, that blanket of snow and it insulating the soil, we found that our plants weren't exposed to as severe temperatures. And so when we looked at the effects of frost severity, and we looked at a gentler or a moderate frost that we might see in the Great Lakes region against a more substantial harsh frost like you might see in the northern Great Plains or the Nordic countries, we definitely saw a response. And the fact is, is that with cover crops and more moderate frosts, they seem to be able to withstand things and not release as, as much. But we also find that it is affected by the species that you use. So if you're in an area that tends to be prone to these frost, uh, significant frost, or you don't have as much snow cover, you might want to optimize the species that you plant to avoid this. Um, the other thing that's important has to do with degree of moisture contact. So if you can see on the screen, we can see some ponding water. And when the plants are submerged under water uh, for extended period of time, periods of time, it kind of steeps them like tea. And that's where you can really run into issues with increased losses from the plants. And so it also, so, so really, I think at the end of the day, cover crops are a great idea in the Great Lakes region. But once you get into these very snowier landscapes where surface runoff becomes a big issue in particulate, the fact is, I think you can enjoy the benefits of cover crops without the risks. Whereas once you get down into the southwestern end where you do often get a complete and total loss of a snowpack, you have to be a little bit more careful and be a little bit more selective with the species that you use. So the closing key messages, different regions have different climates and landscapes, and this affects phosphorus loss throughout the environment. And uh, as a result, the efficacy of conservation practices can differ. And we think that you need to have different phosphorus management zones where we have, we can't say specifically what you're going to do on your field, but we can have general principles where practices might be more or less effective. And from there, we then have a five step adaptive uh, framework where essentially we want to refine these regions and then develop catalogs of more regional specific guidance. And we essentially want to get this messaging out there, test it on the ground, um, and really have this adaptive management back and forth where we can optimize and target conservation practices. Thanks very much.